live from Las Vegas, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Q, covering IBM Insight 2015, brought to you by you IBM. Now your host, Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. We're back to Las Vegas, everybody. This is the Cube. We're here at IBM Insight 2015. Check out ibmgo.com. It's the digital social experience for IBM Insight. Register so you can watch the keynotes. We heard Bob Picciano sort of hosting the keynotes this morning. Jay Porway was sort of kicking things off. Both of those individuals are coming on tomorrow. Jay Prague is here. He's the CIO uh, of Executive Strategy and Information at FNB South Africa, a uh, major financial institution with a really interesting story. Jay, thanks for coming to theCUBE, it's good to see you. Thank you. So, we were talking off camera about what you guys are doing, but uh, this is a great story of what we call systems of intelligence, bringing transactional systems and analytic systems together to this new modern world. And you're beginning that journey actually well into it. So, start with FNB Bank, uh, what you guys are all about and what your role is. All right, so let's go back. Um, I've been at the bank for 32 years, so let's just start briefly in terms of where we were 32 years ago. 32 years ago, we were, we were then called Barclays Bank. We actually were Barclays Bank. Oh. And um, due to sanctions um, in South Africa, Barclays Bank pulled out and we then became FNB. And as part of that conversion from uh, moving from the old ICL systems we had, we migrated onto IBM and a platform called the Hogan Banking Platform, core banking platform. And at that stage, we made a very strategic decision to use IMS, DBDC, as our core uh, transactional database platform. Uh, and I think that decision was a very wise decision at that point in time. If you come to think of, of what we've achieved today in terms of IMS, uh, the application designs underneath it, we have plus minus 30 million lines of COBOL code, which are con we are continuing to, uh, to, uh, to evolve and, and, and uh, sustain that, that technology as we move along. Uh, to our 2025 strategy. Um, uh, it, so, it, so it has helped us a, a, a great deal, uh, sticking to that technology and making it work for us. So uh, a lot of people would say, 30 million lines of COBOL code, oh, mainframe, IMS, why don't you get off that stuff? Why don't you get off that stuff? <laughs> Many reasons, but I think the most important reason is, is the reason of cost. Um, I, um, sustain the actual uh, reliability and scalability of that platform. So if you look at if we want to scale a, a, a IMS application and, and, and we are, uh, our volumes are increasing and more people using our, our, our mobile platforms, to scale is extremely simple. You just fire up ex additional CPUs, you, you fire up additional IMS servers, and you're up and running with, uh, with, uh, with more volumes. So as long as you've designed your applications in the right way, you're able to scale, uh, there's no limit to scalability in terms of, to, in terms of IMS. So that's the first reason. The second reason is got to do with the cost factor, and that is today a typical IMS transaction will cost us under a cent, let's say South African Rand cent, and, and uh, that is extremely cheap to run a transaction performing all the complex functions of payments, deposits, withdrawals, and some very complex uh, corporate functionality as well. And you find that in terms of that cost, it's extremely cheap to run, and therefore you're leveraging that cost into the business as well, and therefore the businesses become a lot more profitable because they're not incurring that huge cost of IT. So given the technology yeah. changes in the last 30 years, yeah. you've obviously assessed you know, the alternatives, uh, and you've determined that it's the, the, the least expensive. And there's an, another factor too, which is risk, yeah. isn't there? I mean, if you had to convert all that COBOL code and get off the mainframe and go to whatever, pick your platform target, you could put yourselves out of business. 100%, because once you do that, the business loses its, its, its insight into making money. So what, they, what they're focusing on is, is taking this huge monstrosity and trying to convert it to a, another platform which you're not even guaranteed it's going to, to give you what you want out of it. Yeah, people right. don't really understand yeah. that nuance. If you were to do that, and I've had clients try to do this, and, and they, they, if you have to do that, you have to freeze the code. If you yeah. don't freeze the code, you'll fail. I've seen clients try to do it without freezing the code, they've almost gone out of business. One in particular cost them $600 million to save 10 million a year, right? And, and, but if you freeze the code, you can't make changes to it, so you can't stay competitive. Yeah. So you're in this position where, you, so you've embraced it and said, 
we're just going to keep adding value to this platform. Yeah, and you must also understand from a from a from a bank perspective, much of the we, we because we're such an innovative bank, most of the innovation happens through our channel layer, our mobile platforms, our online banking layers, our branch platforms, contact centers, and so on. Mm -hmm. And 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 but they use the core, the core banking platform, as the as the the center of, of, of all, all, transac all transactions run through that particular core banking platform. So what we've done is we made the life of a digital channel a lot more simpler because we, we use what we call a services approach. So you write a service once, it's available to any channel straight away. And that philosophy around designs, around architecting solutions the right way, allows us to manage that, that growth of our uh, products and services that we have as well. So it makes businesses a lot, a lot more agile. And yes, agile, agile is, is actually probably a bad word, word to use. It's, it's misunderstood, it's misconstrued. So you, you always end up saying that business will always tell us that we're not agile, but you can see what we deliver. And because we're delivering so often so quickly, we're effectively a very agile environment. We were talking earlier about how you, uh, you are exposing all of your functionality as services internally. Uh, were there any special complexities using COBOL, IMS, using these, these uh, older legacy platforms and, and creating a service-oriented architecture from that? So you remember we started with the service-oriented architecture, designs of it in around about 1999, 2000, right? We deployed in 2000, I think. And, and at that stage, SOA was never matured. If you buy any SOA platform, it wasn't as mature as what they are today. So we've taken some of those learnings, taken the fact that we need to, to cater for scalability, uh, to be as close to the IMS transaction as possible, and, and, and we decided the decision we made then was to write a homegrown services layer that allows us to create the concept of services in COBOL to deploy onto, onto channels for them to use. So we have a very interesting concept around Around, around our services architecture. It is our single point of contact for any channel, and it is a single point of contact to any product house systems we have out there. So it forms the so-called integration framework between the channel and the core banking layer. So it hides the complexity away from the channel. This evidently has not, uh, has not been a problem in terms of the bank innovating. You've been, uh, been received rewards for, for your innovation. You had the first mobile app in South Africa, I understand. Uh, how do you continue to, to move forward with, with, as new technologies come online, uh, how compatible has your, your legacy environment been with, with where, where you want to go? So I think to describe that, one needs to understand the business model we operate. The business model is one in which uh, we operate a federated banking environment, which means we have multiple business units uh, within FNB, uh, and each business unit is responsible, has its own CEO, CIO, and CFO, and they're responsible for generating and focusing on their, on their business uh, strategy. And that creates the innovation around it, because you're focusing on your products, your set of services, and you want to try and manage uh, new products and services and new innovation, innovative products through your, your business unit. And the key to this is not just providing it to your business unit, but also making it sustainable and available for the rest of the business units to use. So we have a, we have a, 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 a customer view of, of our customer. We can see exactly what products he's got, what services he's got enabled with, and at a customer level, we're able to do things very differently uh, uh, compared to not having that view. So for those of us who've been in the business a long time, we've seen a lot of changes, amazing changes. But at the same time, we will often comment, wow, it's like almost the same thing all over again, except you know, it's circa 2015. Thinking about transaction systems, what people now call systems of record, and then people said, okay, well now the things that matter are systems of engagement. That's two, three, four years ago was all the social media craze. Now it's, IBM calls it systems of insight. Others, you know, we use the term systems of intelligence. They, they pose these terms as though they're sort of unique, bespoke, independent entities, but they're not. You're talking about an example where you're bringing systems of record or transaction systems and analytic systems together. Can you talk about that, that process and where you are on that journey? Yeah. So I think let's go back to uh, some of the regulatory environments uh, that we were, we were faced with. We launched, just before the uh, 2008-09 crisis, we launched what we call the National Credit Act. That implied that uh, to get credit, you got to be afford, you got to you got you got to be able to afford that credit, and and therefore you cannot just approach one bank and the, and the bank denies or does not want to give you the credit. You then go off to another bank and hopefully that bank will give it to you. So so the National Credit Act, credit Act implied that all banks had to subscribe to a credit uh, program to say that they will only grant credit to people who can afford. 
in, in, in that particular environment, we had to make sure that as, as we matured in our technology, matured in our services, uh, we 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 able to sell products through our our, our um, online banking platform real time. So I can score you. I can I can I can give you credit all real time online. To do that, we needed the analytics setup behind it. So today it's today it's 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 not it's not real time in terms of the analytics side, but it's real time in terms of decision making. So in other words, here's a customer wanting to to uh, to to apply for a credit card and a overdraft facility for that matter, and. We, we then score the customer, we look at his affordability, we get his credit records, we see if he was uh, anywhere had any problems as, as a customer, and based on his records that we have, we're able to dynamically and, 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 and re at a real time provide him that credit, credit straight away. So he's able to transact on it immediately. And I think that is the type of analytics we, we played with uh, over the last few years. We're getting to a stage where we're realizing that we actually need to move towards a, um, a more real-time approach. Uh, it's also around fraud and so on, so it's, we needed to approach a, a more real-time approach and we're not there as yet, but we're putting a lot of things in place to actually uh, uh, get to that, to that uh, way of transacting. That's one of the reasons um, this Insight conference is, is actually very interesting because some of the things you can learn from here, you can apply and make it, make it uh, work in your environment in, in the way you would like it. So okay. that's a great example. So I call it risk, generally yeah. scoring. And but the business benefit is you're compressing the time to the decision. Yeah. Uh, and you're obviously able to drive more business, presumably. Um, and, and what about fraud? Is that a, a use case that is emerging? Uh, are you there yet? So, so fraud is, is, is really big on things like uh, plastic transactions. So in other words, um, credit card or debit card transactions. So over the years, last few years, um, we converted to EMV, and that has reduced the fraud levels. It still does exist, but, but by moving to an EMV card approach uh, uh, with a chip embedded on the actual plastic itself, uh, we did limit, uh, limit fraud because now you require not just your pin, but you require your pin to be hardened to that particular chip as well, therefore making it a bit more difficult for the guy to manufacture a card. Um, and, and therefore, that created the, 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 um, the that dropped the fraud levels quite, quite nicely. There's still fraud out there, but um, predominantly it's outside um, South Africa. So the credit card is, is reused in a country that does not uh, play in the EMV uh, world as yet. So uh, some of the fraud, uh, uh, fraud elements actually happen in, 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 in the USA. Because all, all you do is you go to a website, as long as you know the guy's card number and his three-digit CVV, you're able to transact. Uh, because there's no, there's, no, there's no checking of the actual chip yet. EMV is not active here in, in a big way, so therefore, uh, um, uh, fraud comes from countries where EMV is not it's not uh, particularly well 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 employed. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of the wild west yeah. here in the United States. Yeah. It's true. I, I haven't been to South Africa in a long time, but even back in the '90s, it was pretty sophisticated from a banking standpoint relative yeah. to the U.S. But what is a so how does the consumer transact business online in, in South Africa? And what's, how does the, what's the hard connection to the EMV? How does that work? Right, so, so um, most, of, most, most uh, people at the bank, so we, let me just explain a bit in, term, in terms of transactability. Most of our transactions are done through online banking and mobile channels. And then obviously ATMs and point of sale. Um, ATMs, we, all our ATMs are chip enabled and all our POS devices are chip enabled as well. So therefore, your chances of fraud are actually very limited in, in, that, in, that, in that way. Mm. Uh, so so, so, so from, from, from a transactional perspective, uh, we're using digital devices quite heavily. I mean, if I look at online banking, we do close to about 290 to 300 million transactions per month, followed closely by uh, uh, the mobile devices. Uh, that's your smart app and your uh, mobile banking environment and some of the prepaid things that we do in South Africa. Remember in a country where uh, we, we, we home to a lot of disadvantaged people and therefore uh, money has to change hands in a very different way, sometimes cash, sometimes digitally. So we're very big on, on the mobile space, allowing transactions to be, ha to be delivered through mobile technology. So example, I could, I could pay you money in, through your cell phone uh, via what we call uh, geopayments and, and you could collect the money at an ATM. Uh, so you don't have to be a bank customer to, to, to actually collect money from, mm -hmm. from a, a bank customer. So it makes some of the things you've done with technology and in the environment we're in in the country, makes better sense to use 
technology then make use of um, brick and mortar type branches. Mm -hmm. yeah. Getting back to, to your legacy environment, your commitment to your legacy environment, yeah. have there been, been any concerns, uh, have you had any concerns about compatibility of new types of applications you may bring in and their backward compatibility with, uh, you know, with, with legacy infrastructure and, and also where do you find coders, COBOL programmers these days? Mm -hmm. Right, so, so first things around compatibility. We run a the IBM mainframe, obviously it's a full-on IBM shop. We stick to all the maintenance uh, levels that we have with new versions of software like the operating system, um, IMS itself, uh, um, and, and uh, we've recently purchased ODM as well, which is uh, uh, one of the engines we use to manage our, um, uh, our rules with, business rules with. Uh, decisions actually done through the ODM engine, real time through a COBOL API. So effectively, we're sitting with an environment that is exceptionally uh, uh, robust. It's, it is managed and maintained the right way. It is, it is secure. We run the entire full stack of IBM cryptography on it as well. Mm -hmm. So it makes the environment very secure. And therefore, uh, to, to, to invest in another platform or try and do something different is, is, is going to be a very difficult decision to make. We can transition to something, but at this point in time, where we stand, um, the mainframe with all its... Um, it setups makes it a lot more easier to manage than... than, than and, and this is an issue that I think is often neglected in our, our, our focus on new technology, that a company like IBM still has a lot of legacy technology out there. They need to support, they need to, to support you. How well has IBM done in, in continuing to keep you current and, and, and upgrade uh, uh, IMS with the new features that you need? So in terms of COBOL and so on, we've done very well in that space, and also the IMS uh, uh, setups in terms of the way it was from the old versions. Remember, I've been around 32 years. So I've been around when IMS 1.2, 1.3 was around. And if I look at the transition from 1.2, 1 1.3 to version 13 that we're running now, and obviously version 14 that's, that's just been announced as well, there's been so many changes across the board, and the biggest changes has been support of large databases, support of open, in, uh, open environments, so the ability to connect to other platforms in an open fashion, using things like TCP IP, IMS Connect, SOAP gateways, all those things that, that, that come with the product base now makes it easier to, to connect to platforms of, of, or, or other disparate platforms out there. Uh, so it's not as difficult as what people make it out to be. It's actually pretty simple to do that now. Okay, getting back to that, that COBOL question, yeah. where do you find COBOL programmers uh, so, today? So I was, I was going to answer that one just now. Um, so what we've done with COBOL is um, over the last 10, 12 years, uh, we started our own training academy. And, and, and what we do is we churn out between, we started churning out between 15 to 20 COBOL programs a year. We've now upped that limit to between 25 to 30 a year. So in about 10, 12 years, we've gone to come, we've actually um, educated people of, of, of uh, disparate cultures, people that never had the opportunity to work with computers, uh, to, to uh, extremely good COBOL programmers and IMS DBAs and systems, uh, uh, MVS system programmers, etc. all coming through that academy. So, and the academy, academy has been running for a very long while. And, and with a very low attrition rate. So you don't outsource that? You, you, no. It's really internal. We are a large scale development shop. We've run, we do everything ourselves. Somebody uh, at this conference last year, I think it was an executive from B of A, she said, the banking industry is starting to realize people um, need banking, but they may not need banks. Sort of the, you know, it was the disruptive theme, right? Mm -hmm. So your industry is, you know, getting disrupted. You're seeing, you know, Apple Pay and Square and all Bitcoin, kinds of interesting right. things. And, and I was going to ask you about cryptocurrency. Where do you see those? disruptors and how can you become the disruptor? So we've been pretty pretty good at, at, at disrupting banking in South Africa uh, in terms of our innovations and so on and what we've done around, around, uh, around banking as well. For an example, we give you a reward for banking with us. So we pay out more in rewards than what you pay in service fees in a, in a, in a, as a customer. And we reward you for good behavior. We reward you for using credit the right way. We reward you for making use of your credit card in the correct fashion. Uh, so, so as a customer, uh, it makes sense for you to, to bank with someone who, who takes you as an individual, not just an individual, your family into account. Uh, we be able to, to work with you. Because if you then go to someone else and says, you know what, bank with FNB because we believe that they have the, the best uh, processes, the best banking platform around to help with all your needs, then that's a type of, of, of sort of uh, marketing we can get out of, out of people. So we treat people the right way. We want to make sure we've got the right sets of customers. And, and from there onwards, you would, you would just continue growing. But disruption is there. Uh, there's a lot of disruption happening in, in, in that space around payments. 
Um, and I, th I think we're gonna, we, we, we are geared up to a point, but uh, I think we, we, we're partnering with the right people, so I think we'll, we'll be fine. All right, Jay, we're out of time, but yeah. uh, so I'll just, last question is, you know, what are you learning at Insight? What are you getting out of the event? Are you having a good time? What, uh, give us the bumper sticker yeah, on the well, show. I mean, I enjoy Vegas, it's nice. Uh, <laughs> uh, the nightlife's excellent here. That's because uh, you don't yeah. come here like <laughs> us 20 <laughs> times a year. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. no. and, and, and I think uh, what I want to get out of it is, is, is this whole real-time analytics at an IMS transactional level. And I think if we get that right, uh, I think we are a long way to, to, uh, to getting what we done, uh, what we want real-time. Great story, Jay. It's, uh, so often it's not about the technology, about the people in the process around the technology and how you involve, uh, evolve that. So thanks very much for coming to the Cube. It's great to meet you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is the Cube. We're live from IBM Insight 2015. We'll be right back.